Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Bay of Quincy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Canada's science and research ecosystem is extremely important. And it's important for economic development in Canada, and we must ensure there's equal opportunities for all Canadians and international talent who wish to work in Canada in order to fill a shrinking labour pool and to fill an enormous and important growing future in Canada. We've never seen a moment like this in history in terms of the amount of change that has already started with five innovation platforms evolving at the same time. You have to go back to the early 1900s uh, to see anything like it, where we had three platforms then. In the 1900s, we had the telephone, we had the automobile and electricity. Today, you have DNA sequencing, robotics, blockchain technologies, energy storage, and AI. All of them are exponential growth and converging with each other in profound ways. Over the past several months, those of us in science and research committee have been studying the state of science and research in Canada and found a few fundamental conclusions. Actually, we found three of them. One, Canada is leading in several key areas of research worldwide, including genomics, DNA sequencing, biomanufacturing, and AI and quantum physics. We have an incredible genomics program in Canada. Uh, when it comes to AI, uh, University of Waterloo and the, the Kitchen area is doing incredible things in quantum. We lead the world in quantum computing, which is all fascinating and far above what I sometimes understand. But we're failing when it comes to not only funding for research and specifically private business research funding, but what we call the valley of death. We give a lot of money to universities who develop intellectual property and then that intellectual property gets shelved and it stays in a drawer and we don't commercialize it. That valley of death is costing us a lot of money. The measure of science and research in Canada is intellectual property. We call it the currency of innovation. Patents, trademarks, copyrights and trade secrets. But we are following behind the world in getting science and research out the door. Dr. Bell stated that the question of how to attract and retain Todd scientists should therefore be rooted in how science innovation can be fostered in Canada right now. Translating that IP and then commercializing it and accelerating Canadian companies and then Canadian GDP should be paramount to our whole strategy of how Canada develops and attracts talent. If we compare ourselves to the United States, the United States creates 169 times the IP Canada does despite only being 10 times our size. They, they have $6.6 .6 trillion of IP. And nearly 90% of the growth of the United States can be contributed to the generation and commercialization of IP. What that means to Canada is that we, if we attribute just 5% of GDP growth through innovation and research and development, that would equate to over $80 billion in GDP and thousands of high paying jobs. Of the recommendations from the first report that we submitted from the Science and Research Committee, the first report, and I want to thank uh, the Chair Kirsty Duncan for starting this committee, it's very important to Canada, is the aspect that Canada is lagging in attracting and retaining top talent with research and innovation, much parallel to the crisis we have with the shortage of skilled trades and workers across this nation. This is a main barrier alongside bridging the valley of death to unlocking Canada's true economic potential. We have an acute labour shortage right now in Canada. To add to our acute housing crisis and to add to our acute inflation crisis. And they are all converging at the same time, mass causing massive economic peril to our nation. We are short 1.03 million jobs in this country right now. And it's risen 150,000 jobs in just a few months. Help wanted signs are all over Canada. I don't think there's a riding that's spared from the perils of employers who are looking for employees. And the cost of that, we haven't spoken very much in this parliament, the cost, according to the Conference Board of Canada, is $25 billion. Now compare that to our tourism industry in Canada, the tourism industry we're trying to get back on pace. That industry is worth $35 billion to Canada. So the cost of not having talent in Canada is costing us $25 billion a year. It's costing employers, it's costing companies. When companies can't scale and they can't grow, that costs Canada money. And it costs us that money that we need to grow this country and to ensure we're becoming the best country we can. When it comes to top scientists, Dr. Thomas Bell stated in the committee, he's a professor at the Imperial College in London, 
Top scientists are attracted by top science. The best scientists will not come to Canada and will not stay in Canada if they feel their science will suffer. Dr. Bell stated that the question of how to attract and retain top scientists should therefore be rooted in how science innovation should be fostered in Canada right now. Dr. Bell also spoke to how attracting scientists and retaining scientists are two separate issues. You know, when you're trying to attract a scientist, there are significant academic costs in moving labs. It's hugely disruptive. Packing up and resembling a lab takes time, often resulting in months of inactivity. Moving to a new university means relearning all of the in internal systems and ways of doing things. And moving countries is no doubtedly disruptive. Scientists moving to Canada for the first time need to learn how funding and hiring works and how to attract students. And they need to build their collaboration networks from scratch. Many will have young families and would need to learn how the school system works. The cost of moving is therefore very high for a scientist, so attracting the top scientists to Canada is more difficult than retaining scientists. If you want to attract the top scientists from outside the country, these significant additional costs would be considered. We spoke to many different witnesses in the Science and Research Committee, including the Chancellor from the University of Waterloo, who stated that we're losing 75% of our software engineering grads to the US. So retaining top talent is something we're not only striving for, but we're failing at. When it comes to attracting top talent, Canada starts at a disadvantage. In particular, we need good Canadian research chairs to oversee major development and research in intellectual property. But overreach of government policy are leaving applicants out despite their well intentions. Diversity targets set by the government are unrelated to the research, but only to fulfill targets of inclusivity rather than included in as a criteria that includes merit. This new practice is called target ad postings, meant to fill diversity, equality, and inclusive targets, and they were created to tick boxes off as per government quotas or lose government funding. Examples of targeted ad postings for CRC positions included a Queen's University posting for an engineering chair was only open to women. Men, no, not apply. That means that if a black man of equal merit were to apply, it didn't qualify. A University of Waterloo faculty of environment position exempted men from applying. That meant if an Aboriginal male applied, he was not considered despite any merit he might have. All these institutions were following guidance and diversity targets laid out by the Tri-Agency Institutional Programs Secretariat, which is the government body responsible for administrating the CRC program. The promotion of diversity, equality and inclusion allows CRC program job postings to exclude applicants if they don't meet diversity targets. And that is wrong. Target postings need to be reviewed so that diversity, inclusion and equality are key pillars in hiring. But the practice of exclusion needs to be reviewed immediately as it sets a target for a quality of outcome and instead of providing all candidates with an equality of opportunity. Only an equality of opportunity will ensure we both look at breaking down barriers that exist with inclusion and diversity while still ensuring we see top talent hired where we need it. Only by ensuring there is a quality of opportunity do we ensure we don't practice inclusion by excluding someone else? Additionally, because we are also striving for a quality of opportunity for all our institutions, Canadian research chairs should always maintain excellence as their primary criterion. We are simply not seeing enough talent. And what that means by a quality of opportunity is we break down barriers that exist. Let me tell you, it's not going to be easy and it's going to be quite hard, but we have to do that. Especially when some smaller institutions are lucky to get any applicants and are under threat to meet quotas or lose fundings. By all means, let's work together towards improved opportunities for everyone, but let's not pretend that targeting hires doesn't, by design, put other criteria ahead of excellence or put some institutions ahead of others. As Professor David Wolf has noted from the Monk School of Global Affairs from the University of Toronto, talent was important 20 years ago, and it's 10 times more important now. If we don't support and nurture that talent put into the local labour market, we don't have the base either to grow our own domestic firms or to attract other firms 
into our regions. The CRC program was launched in 2000, in 2000 to fund 2,000 research chairs, although there are now 2,285 of them, to attract and keep top academics in Canada. Tier 2 chairs are for five-year terms, and they're worth $100,000 in annual federal funding and are awarded to emerging researchers. Tier 1 chairs reward ward-leading academics with $200,000 annually over seven years. The research chairs are Canada's effort to recruit top talent from around the world and enhance our competitiveness. We need more than one demographic, though, or two groups to do that. With the 2022 deadline looming, universities are acting on their EDI plans. UBC, which has 199 chairs, has filled 60 CRC positions to 2020, 2020, which is great. But they're all targeted hires. And Moro uh, Quayle, who's the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, said, we've been more successful with white women, but now we're over that target. But we need to now work on people with disabilities. Great, that's fantastic for UBC. But, you know, but now white women are gonna be excluded. And at the same time, we look at that across the nation, you know, when we have a lack of talent that's able to apply for these institutions. And we look at areas like Quebec, who have smaller institutions in smaller areas, you know, we're eliminating huge sections of the population. Instead of looking at the barriers that exist for those individuals to apply and to get into the programming. And I think when it comes to this motion, that's all we're looking at. A review of the program and the motions, or the, the criterion, to ensure that anyone that wants to get an education and become a, a Canadian scientist or work with our innovation sectors in Canada, which are going to grow, by the way, to 2.25 million jobs by 2026, which is 11 percent of the whole workforce population. And those jobs, by the way, pay over eighty, ninety thousand dollars You know, anyone who wants to be a scientist should be afforded the opportunity to do just that. And our government, when we're looking at a million jobs short and all the jobs short in our science and research uh, industry should be looking as best we can to ensure anyone who wants to join the industry has the opportunity to do so. Anyone from any creed, any background, and any community. We're doing it all wrong, and this practice is not only excluding candidates in the name of exclusion, it's not a one-size-fits-all across the nation. Each region in Canada has its own talent needs. What I love about the college system, there is a college within 50 kilometers of 90%, 95% of Canadians. So, 95% of Canadians have a college system within 15 kilometers. Through our research for top talent for SRSR, science and research, we have found that universities and colleges are located, in a certain, if they're located in a certain region or city, it encourages students to enroll there and enables people in the labor force to go back to university to develop their talent if they so wish. Furthermore, follow-up data on graduates shows that students who have studied in the region generally pursue careers there. For nursing talent, the universities of Trois-Rivières, Ramanuski, and Abiti uh, Timiskanig offer nursing programs. And we learned this in science and research. Did I mess that name up? Abiti Timiskanig. Abiti Timiskanig. Thank you very much. Between 80% and 90% of professionals trained by those universities remain and work in those regions. So those universities are training nurses who are working in those same regions which desperately need nurses. Madam Speaker, we are 60,000 short in nurses in Canada right now. The work of inclusion and diversity would include, in this instance, not just hiring qualified applicants from diverse backgrounds, but ensuring that colleges break down barriers and enroll students from all backgrounds. But colleges need funding, and not all funding is equal. So if we want to talk about quality of opportunity, let's go and look at the funding. It's well known that 15 universities in Canada receive over 72% of research funding. Let's just think about that for a moment. There's over 380 colleges in Canada. 15 universities receive 70% of all research funding. Colleges receive 2.5% of funding. And what's been awesome in this committee is that when we look at what colleges do, especially when it comes to commercializing IP for existing companies, they're doing that work. They're engaging with companies and they're doing such great things. But my point is setting diversity targets follows funding that is absolutely lopsided to a few than to the many. And I'm talking about another problem, which is where Canada, you know, we spread the peanut butter a little too thin across the country. 
But when we look at programs, research and development that needs extra funding that can attract many Canadians to participate in innovative prospects of Canada, we need to ensure we look closely at where funding is going, how we're attracting talent, where the talent is needed, and ensuring we're developing those programs and the science to make sure Canada prospers and Canada will prosper from that. We need to work more on breaking down barriers for equality of opportunity. That means more work, not less. That means that we make diversity a top priority, not cherry picking the results we want. JP Morgan in the UK, for instance, is pushing for more inclusion of black diversity in the finance industry, which recently held its first EMEA black advocacy program with about 200 people from institutions across London gathering to discuss how progress can be made. The bank in the UK has increased its black UK employees by 45% by breaking down barriers and ensuring that black people see themselves in roles and seek to obtain the education for the roles for what they want to do. It involved mentorship. It involved making sure that there was community promotion and inclusiveness. It made sure that there was internship programs and co-ops. It meant breaking down a lot of barriers that existed in those communities. It did not mean for so those 45% that those positions were posted only for black men uh, for JP Morgan. That's not how it was done, nor how it should be done. In Canada, we see barriers broken every day. The Alpine Club of Canada just appointed its first female leaders, Isabel Degno, the first female president, and Karine Salvi, the first female executive director. The Alpine Club is an organization based in Camwell, Alberta, that manages a network of cabins across Canada's remote backcountry and has worked to educate people in the world of mountain climbing. It was a big barrier, and it took many years, but how great and how much we can celebrate that that barrier was broken. Amita Kuttner is Canada's first trans person, the first person of East, East Asian descent to lead a major, major Canadian political party, the Green Party, which is very important, and, and a major glass ceiling that's been broken. Uh, we have Major Guntour, who is a, uh, a major and, and an F-18 fighter pilot in Cold Lake, Alberta. How amazing is that? Uh, to have those barriers broken. And in my own writing today, I'm sad, Madam Speaker, to announce that our own Ly Loyalist College CEO, Dr. Anne-Marie Vaughan, is resigning to become Humber College's first female president and CEO uh, near Toronto. So, of course, we're, we're sorry to lose her, but how great is it that she is breaking barriers and moving on. Our university college and polytechnic system has been a critical provider for many of our technical skill shortages for technology clusters across Canada in the last two decades, and we are so happy that she has been a leader in our region for that. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we really have to look at what, what this motion is and, and what it isn't. You know, this motion is about looking at a quality of opportunity for all Canadians. And what I think this motion and the parts that I like about it is that we're going to review a program that ensures that we're, we're making sure that the barriers that exist are going to be broken down. And then with the other side of it is we make sure that we do things the right way to ensure that when we're funding research in Canada, we're getting the best and brightest as well as having an inclusive and diversive uh, policy. And that means not posting jobs that say for women only, for um, a, a different sect or a diversity only, that we include that in decision making and policy making and interview processing and barriers to education and funding. You know, Madam Speaker, as a, I believe as a parliamentarian, as a conservative, as a Canadian, in equality of opportunity versus Canadians versus equality of outcome. Canadians are each unique, innovative, creative, entrepreneurial, competitive. And as long as we focus on breaking down barriers, we focus on that equality of leveling the starting blocks from which we start. Equality of outcome as a goal skips the part, whereas Canadians, we can do the work ourselves, and it is a utopian fantasy that often ends as a dystopian outcome, excluding someone else in the name of inclusion. We are a great nation. We have so much to achieve. And as we work through the work in reporting and new science and research in India, I look forward to the policy that not only build the future, a policy for a government that embraces this new era to which Canada has the opportunity to leap and bound, but it ensures we break down any and all barriers for the future leaders in this country and for all that will find this country home. Let's not practice inclusion with exclusion. Let's break down barriers to include everyone and provide equality and opportunity. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments. Questions and commentaires. The Honourable Member for Shefford.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for Bay of Quinty for his speech. He talked about equality of opportunity. I share that value. And as the critic for the status of women, I'd like to bring a feminist perspective to the issue. In Quebec, we have worked hard to better integrate groups to our research chairs. My colleague for La Prairie discussed the importance of working upstream and asking questions. For example, why are women still considered underrepresented in the country? For example, during the pandemic, we know that many women weren't able to complete their research program because they were at home with children, for example. And so how can we better create work-life balance policies so that women can be both a parent and a research chair instead of using criteria that exclude people? For example, white men of a certain age. How can we instead attract upstream these underrepresented groups? Okay. Uh, thank you very much to our, my honorable member from Quebec. And, you know, as I've noted in my speech, I think we have to look further downstream to, to how we attract those individuals into our education and how we then uh, ensure that those people have equal opportunity when it comes to the jobs, which means breaking down those barriers. Um, I, I, I know that we can all agree that any Canadian who has the, the opportunity and the education uh, has the merit and has the ability to, to get themselves into a position they want. That's, as I mentioned, what I love about uh, individualism is that all of us as Canadians have the ability, the competitiveness, the drive, the work ethic to be able to do that. And that's all Canadians. And I think what's been really great, as we've seen lately, is we have women, for instance, breaking down those barriers. We have people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds breaking those areas. We're seeing it happen. We just have to ensure, I think, that those barriers that exist in the beginning, whatever they may be, we have honest discussion of them. We speak about them, we break them down, and we ensure that everyone has that equal opportunity to achieve what they want to achieve. Thank you. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Chief. Yes, thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think the member made reference to uh, uh, research shares from, I think it was UBC, where he said that uh, more than 50% are now uh, female. And I think if that was the case, what he was trying to refer to, it kind of sets the, the example. Uh, it proves the situation where, uh, as a society, we need to do what we can to ensure that there is a higher sense of equality and, and, and fairness, that you have to take actions in order to encourage that to, to take place. Uh, an example, I would just look in, in the front benches of government, where we now have, for example, 50 percent of cabinet uh, that are female. Um, and it's a specific action. And when you, when you see that wider participation, whether it's females, visible minorities, people with disabilities, it does inspire others uh, to, uh, to take on uh, that larger role. In particular, I'm focusing on young people. And if he could provide his thoughts on that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, to respond to the member, I think the difference between women who have earned their place and women being appointed to their place is paramount. And I think from women that I've spoken to, they, they hold offense to the fact that they have to be appointed in order to make it to a position rather than earning their place as they should, and they do. And I think the difference with that is we're jumping, we're jumping a couple of paces or a couple of steps on that. Eliminating barriers allows women to that any barrier they have or anyone with an ethnic diversity get through that barrier in order to earn their own place on the podium. But when we jump that and we say, well, we know there's barriers, but we're just going to appoint you anyhow, we eliminate the systemic problems that exist in the first place. UBC, who appointed 60 positions, and what they did is, it's not appointment, they target added, meaning they posted a job for women only to apply. The problem when you do that and you fill a quota the next ad would say, well, only people with a disability apply and women are excluded. We can't exclude those in order to get others ahead. What we have to do is break the barriers down, to your point, so we have more women who want to enter politics who can and then are able to then do it on their own merit because we know they... Just, just a reminder to the Honourable Member that I didn't make any point. I'm the Honourable Member for Nanaimo Lady Smith. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for his intervention. Uh, if I could speak quite frankly, I'm very disheartened that this is a debate that we are having today, and 
quite frankly, am feeling um, uh, that many of the comments made in the previous intervention were insulting to many. Um, I'm standing here today and, and, and want to express that there is a big difference between equity and equality, and it is clear that that concept is not being understood. Uh, we are, have so many systems that were built by white men for white men, and to say that we should not be providing equitable opportunities and looking at these systems to ensure that everybody has access to these systems uh, is clearly uh, inaccurate. I would ask the member to please uh, take a moment to look at the Conservative Party and, and to uh, uh, share today whether uh, this theory of equality is working well with the Conservative Party with currently only 18 per cent representation of women uh, within the caucus. And clearly this is a uh, evident, uh, uh, this shows here the evidence that we need that this equality theory that's being proposed today is not effective in ensuring equitable access to everyone to these systems made by white men. Thank you. Well, member for Bay of Quinte. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm a little confused on, on the comment. It's a quality of opportunity for everyone. Um, I think everyone in Canada would like that. But if she talks about the Conservative Party, you know, we have uh, members from all different sects of this country, from all, all, all certain, uh, we have the first female Prime Minister in this the country only? for the Conservative Party, the only female Prime Minister in this country. Uh, you know, we have members who rep represent uh, you know, our, our uh, gay community, that are ethnic, that have different backgrounds. You know, it's not about us, it's about Canadians as a whole having equal opportunity. And I, would, I, have, a, I have a daughter who's four years old, and, I'll, and I, I, I understand the rest, but I think for all of our daughters and anyone across this country, all we ask for is equal opportunity for those children to get an education, to ensure they're included and inclusive, uh, to ensure that they have opportunity to work hard, and achieve what they want to achieve. You know, we look at barriers in our, in our institutional systems, in our schools, in our communities themselves. You know, I think what we're all saying here is when it comes to funding, funding should follow exactly what we're practicing in, Can in Canada, what we're trying to drive to, is that everyone should have the same opportunity as everyone else. And those that work hard and achieve that and get to this place or others have done it on their own accord and not because someone else told them to do it, it's because they did it. I think that's really important. Thank you. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Yeah, no, uh, to my honourable colleague from uh, Bay of Quinte, I, I think that it's under, unappreciated by some in this place that the barriers to entry for women are quite significant and that they won't be broken down unless the first step is to ensure what is, used to be called affirmative action. And that's just recognizing women like me, who are women of privilege by the color of our skin. If we're going to also want to ensure diversity and inclusion and equity, we need to do more. I am reminded of one of the really good things that this prime minister did, which was appointing a gender equal balanced cabinet. And I recall him vividly. The conservative commentator, well, media commentators, I won't, yeah, by conservative, I didn't mean capital C conservative, that wasn't a partisan comment, but some of the commentators on the national news saying, oh, are we now going to have less qualified cabinet members because the prime minister is forced to find 50% of them as women? It was so insulting, but it was so ingrained that the cabinet ministers in this country, the members of parliament, are all supposed to be white men, and they were from 1867 until Agnes McPhail was elected. The Honourable Member for Bay of Quinty. And she was a conservative. Well, Madam Speaker, I, you know, I'll start with, I'm, I'm not going to take a lot of lessons from this leader, considering how the last leader of the Green Party was treated. You know, I think at the end of the day... By you, by you. You know, at the end of the day, we have to look at breaking barriers down, right? The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands on a point of order. The heckling that I just experienced was a personal attack to my personal integrity, and I take personal offence and ask the Honourable Member to withdraw those remarks because they are untrue, untrue, unfounded, and based on malicious gossip, and he should be ashamed. Particularly partisan issues are not the, the, the business of the House and should not be dealt by the House. Uh, so I'd like the Honourable Member to uh, please address the Honourable Member. Senator. To the Member for comment. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't understand when we're talking about quality of opportunity and especially breaking down barriers with the honourable member 
would rather have been appointed to the position she holds in this parliament rather than earning it as she rightfully has and rightfully has done so. And at the end of the day, when we talk to women and to people across Canada, should they have to be appointed in order to break down barriers or can they not break them down on their own accord? Equality of opportunity means that we break the barriers down so those individuals can do just that. And that's all we're talking about. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming.